Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Hello, Laura and Neil. It is seven o'clock sharp, so we're going to go ahead and kick off our program. And so uh, tonight, we are pleased to welcome back uh, Neil Yamamoto, and we'll, uh, we will introduce him in a second. He's going to talk about the 442nd. Uh, but Laura has been gracious enough to give me about three or four minutes at the beginning to uh, talk about some of our other upcoming programs. So um, let's go to the next slide, Laura. Okay, so next, I guess in two weeks from today, we will continue on with our 30th anniversary of uh, Operation Desert uh, Storm. And we are going to have a veteran from the artillery, uh, Devardi Division Artillery, uh, speaking to us about his book and also his personal experiences serving in a desert uh, storm 30 years ago this year. And so please tune in to that. And also last month, or correction, two weeks ago, this is our second one uh, in two weeks, I announced our upcoming footsteps of the first. And so I would really like most of you to go to the website and just really check this out. This is our first of many travel programs. Uh, we are partnered with a uh, professional travel agency. And this is not only following the footsteps of the first from D-Day, June 6, 1944, until the end of the Battle of the Bulge around mid-January 1945. But there is a lot of culture uh, built into the program. Uh, there is a lot of cuisine and some uh, beverage activities <laughs> built into the program and some leisure time. Uh, you can see the date. It's from 5 to 16 September. And when you go to the website, you will see all of the documents and all of the mitigating strategies that have been put into place in reference to the footsteps happening either in September or a little later. Uh, make no mistake about it, this will not be canceled, but it may be postponed. Um, so go to the website and check out all of those documents. And the other thing I really uh, want to say is right now we are at 50% of our minimum capacity. So people have already been joining the footsteps of the first and we are 25% of our maximum capacity. Uh, so there is a maximum capacity. And so for those of you who are ready to begin travel as we come out of this pandemic, uh, this is a great program that we hope you join us on. Okay, I think we're ready to go to the next slide, Laura, and I'll turn it over to you for um, a moment. Thank you. Um, this isn't something that we normally do at the top of all of our presentations, but I, I just wanted to take a second to thank all of you who are watching us and in the audience this evening. It's actually been um, really my honor, my pleasure to plan this presentation uh, along with Neil for everybody. Um, one of the unique things that happened is I received so many emails from those of you sharing your fathers, your grandfathers, your uncles, your cousins, your family's service with us with the 442nd and um, it's just been my pleasure to learn all of it and to hear from you and really kind of feel um, really special about this presentation tonight. And some of you were so gracious that you sent me photos of your family members. So I just wanted to um, showcase some of the photos that I received this evening. They're just so wonderful and they make me so happy. So I just wanted to take this second to, on behalf of myself, Krosky Salter, uh, Neil Yamamoto, the entire McCormick Foundation and the First Division Museum and Kitchen Park, I just want to say a big Thank you for your service to all of the family members who are joining us. Your family's service is so important and we thank you for it. And for the veterans of the 442nd who are watching this evening, thank you for your service. Um, I do wanna give a little special um, hello to one of our uh, coworkers at the First Division Museum, Ken Kahawara, who is a Vietnam veteran. Uh, so thank you, Ken, for your service. I know you're watching tonight, but uh, his father, Ikoro Kawahara is pictured in the top center photo. And I know he's going to try and join us this evening as well. So thank you for your service. Also, we talked about this earlier and I said, uh, you know, Laura and I kind of get together before a lot of these programs and she showed me uh, some of these images. So first of all, we also want to give a great birthday shout out, correct, Laura? This is yes. the 98th birthday, I believe last week 
of Terry Shima, who's right in the uh, bottom center. I hope I pronounced his last name correctly. But Laura, this is the surprise yes, that I asked you for. So I want to read something. Um, you know, I, I wrote something uh, a couple of years ago. It's called Citizenship Delayed, Asian Pacific Americans in the Military and Their Pathway to Citizenship. So what I'm about to read is first person. This is in the intro of the special study. When I was a major serving as a battalion executive officer in the 3rd Infantry Division at Fort Stewart, Georgia, my senior raider was Brigadier General Joseph F. Peterson. Despite the Anglo name, General Peterson is a big guy of Hawaiian, Japanese, and Chinese descent. And I go on to say a few other things. And then I closed a paragraph on General Peterson by saying, I finally remember my one-on-one -on -one senior Raider evaluation sessions with General Peterson. And he was a gregarious guy. He was, he, I mean, he would sit down and talk to you. I was a major, he was a one-star general. And he said, Salter, why don't you come to the Asian Pacific American program? And this was in 1998. So Laura, that gentleman, that general in the top right-hand corner, yeah, that was my senior Raider 20 years ago. So General Peterson, or if anyone knows whoever sent that picture in, I would love for General Peterson to write me at the First Division Museum. So that's the collection. So when I saw that image today, Laura, that's why oh, I was special. trying to hold my excitement back. And I asked you for a few minutes tonight. So it's just how great special. how small the world is. Uh, he we was always uh, say, yep, he was small my army. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so let's uh, get on with the program. Absolutely. So let's do the housekeeping and make sure I hit everything. So I'm gonna go to my notes now. Uh, we're going to follow our traditional uh, date with history format for questions. So in the last 15 minutes of this presentation, everyone will be able to submit questions uh, actually during the presentation and my colleague, Laura, will get to as many questions as possible. And you can submit your question using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we will get to as many as we can. And I wanna make sure that you do not use the hand raising feature, but use the Q&A feature. Um, and knock on wood and glass, uh, we haven't had any technical difficulties during the pandemic. Laura's been doing a great job. Um, and our technical uh, team has been doing a great job and we do not foresee uh, any tonight. And Neil is in Hawaii. So a uh, great connection. You're coming through uh, great, Neil. And so what I wanna do now is introduce Neil. So some of you who have tuned in before, uh, you recognize Neil, he's back. And uh, when we were talking, when he was, uh, he did the USS Missouri, I believe it was, uh, which is where you work. And beforehand, we talked about some of the connections of history that we have. And we talked about the 442nd. And I said, wouldn't it be great to have you back? Of course, I go on and do my thing, but you have great teammates like Laura. And we were going over our schedule earlier in the year. And she said, hey, uh, Neil's gonna be back and he's gonna talk about the 442nd. So I was very excited. And thanks, Laura, and thanks, Neil, for making sure you are back. So let's read Neil's uh, bio. Uh, Neil Yamamoto is a fifth generation Japanese American. His family has roots in Hawaii since, 18, since the 1890s. Neil specializes in Japanese American history and the 442nd Regimental Combat Team. His grandfather and uncles served in that unit during World War II. Neil is a graduate of the University of Northern Colorado and holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in history. He has created the educational curriculum for two 442nd Regimental Combat Team specific projects. Journey of Heroes, which is a comic book detailing the formation, the combat exploits, and the legacy of the 442nd Regimental Combat Team and Go For Broke, an origin story. 
a Hawaii produced feature film about the formation of the Varsity Victory Volunteers and the 442nd Regimental Combat Team. And so Neil, let's go ahead and get this kicked off. Um, you know, we talked a little, but I um, don't wanna put you on the spot, but I'm always curious, you know, what pulls an individual towards their chosen area of history or political science, and in this case, history, you know, what made you decide to become an expert in the 442nd? Because I think about my own journey, um, and I'm an American historian, I'm a military historian. And so I started studying African American history, and I wasn't, I didn't have to be pulled, kicking and, and screaming to study African American history, uh, but I did have to be coached into maybe combining um, African American history and my love for military history and for what I uh, was at the time uh, in graduate school, an African American officer in the military. And so one of my professors in graduate school is the one that suggested, well, Salter, you need to pick a topic that no one or not many people have done because you're gonna live with it for a long time. So I did decide to study the African-American military experience and specifically officers. And so that's how I got pulled in to my area of studying uh, history, that small niche area. So how, I mean, did, did you gravitate to this area from a young age or was it evolutionary or revolutionary? Say, um, you know, it's sort of evolutionary and it sort of was from a young age, um, you know, growing up as the, as the descendant of, of uh, members of the 442 um, from World War II. Uh, my father is also a Vietnam veteran. Um, I actually have lineage in the United States Army and the United States military from uh, World War I uh, with the Hawaiian division. My great grandfather was a soldier in World War I. And um, so it kind of was an organic experience really. Um, you know, you grow up, you hear about the exploits of the 442 and you go to grandpa and you ask grandpa, uh, what'd you do in the war grandpa? And, you know, just wanting to you know being an inquisitive, you know, middle schooler, elementary school. And uh, my grandfather and my uncles never really talked much about it. And they, you know, it was very indicative. I think, you know, as I gotten older, it's indicative of that veterans mindset that, uh, you know, they don't want to talk about their exploits. And so what I've learned is that if you really want to know, ask their friends. <laughs> um, but what ended up happening was in the eighth grade, uh, I had a teacher named Mary Riley at King Intermediate School here in Hawaii, who um, who asked us to write a, a history day project. And I decided to write my history day project on the 442. And um, so I delved deep into, into the, the wartime history of it and, you know, understanding why these guys were separated, you know, because I looked in the mirror and I saw Japanese features and I looked at all my friends, all my friends were, you know, of all these different races, you know, ethnic backgrounds, whatnot, white, African-American, you know, Asian, Hawaiian, whatever it was. And I couldn't quite understand as an eighth grader why these guys were so special, why these guys were so, you know, segregated. And so I started to understand that, you know, to, to look more into that, uh, the social history of that, and then come across the wartime exploits and hear about, you know, these heroes, these, these you know, over 4,000 uh, Purple Hearts, you know, some thousands and thousands of individual medals and things. And I think to myself, and I went to my grandfather before he passed. He passed when I was in the eighth grade. And I asked him, I said, Grandpa, did you get any of those medals when you were in World War II? And he said, yeah, I don't really know why they gave them to me. I was just doing my job. I looked in the, in the record books. My grandfather was recipient of a Bronze Star Medal and two Purple Hearts. And, you know, that kind of stuck with me, you know, because I knew what the Purple Heart was all about. And... Um, I guess as time progressed for me, it was like, OK, 
okay, these guys are really special and someone needs to tell their story. And so I, over time, you know, just being a part of the family was telling that story. And then I met a bunch of very wonderful people, some of whom are on the call tonight. I saw some of the names of, of friends, my friend Ben Fujie out there, uh, Ford Abisu, all great people um, who've kind of coached me, you know, whether they realize it or not, have kind of coached me into, you know, delving a little deeper and, and finding out more and, and helping more to tell the story. And I think that's been the biggest draw for me is to make sure that these stories aren't forgotten. They don't go by the wayside. We lose so many of these veterans every day that, uh, you know, it's become our charge and our mandate as the younger generation, I'm only 38 years old, uh, to keep this history and keep that story alive. I do want to give a quick shout out to one other person on the uh, call tonight is, uh, is Keith Horikawa. Keith Horikawa is actually a former commander of the 10442 in the Army Reserve. And, uh, you know, so sir, thank you. I know, I don't know if you can hear me, but thank you, sir, for being here. And uh, I do certainly hope that we're doing your unit proud. And for all those veterans that are out there, I do certainly hope that what I'm going to share this evening uh, will do you proud and uh, properly honor that legacy. I think, you know, being a Japanese American, that's been something that's been pounded into me since day one is honor the legacy, honor the family, don't bring shame to the family. That's been a big part of, of the, uh, I don't want to say samurai mindset, but that's kind of that idea, even for these American soldiers as they went off to war was, you know, the, and I'll quote um, a, a unique quote from, and I'm sure it wasn't all that unique, but a quote that I heard directly from Senator Inoue, who's a uh, veteran of the 442, his father, when he went off to war, his father said, live if you can, die if you must, but always fight with honor. And I think that that's been, you know, for, for me, that's been a driving force in trying to tell the story right the best way that I know how. Well, you are doing an outstanding job and we're gonna turn everything over to you. We're in good hands. All right, Thank thanks everybody. Uh, Krosky and I are gonna step out for a little bit. We're gonna let Neil uh, give him a second to get his PowerPoint up and we'll let him get going. Thank you, everybody. All right, everyone. Well, thank you so much uh, to Dr. Salter and Laura for inviting me and allowing me to, to share with all of you. Um, the title of my presentation this evening is titled, But One Loyalty. And we'll explain a little more about what that all means um, as we go further. But I wanted to start by talking a little bit about the photograph that you see here. This photograph is taken uh, in the 19, I wanna say late 1930s by a very famous photographer named Dorothea Lang. And Dorothea Lang, of course, if you've heard of Migrant Mother, uh, that's one of her most famous photographs. But I like this one a lot because you see a, a mixing of culture here in America. You see these children who are pledging allegiance to the flag of the United States of America you see Japanese children, you see uh, Caucasian children, you see a few African-American children, and they're all together all at once. And it seems like they're, they're all pledging their allegiance to the flag. At, at least that's what I understand this photograph is. is. And uh, the reason I chose to title my presentation, But One Loyalty, is because even though as Japanese Americans, we look different, there's no, there's, I don't wanna bring race into this really, but there's no doubting that we are different. We look different. But as we'll find out hopefully through the rest of the presentation, it didn't matter what we looked like, we had but one loyalty to the United States. But in order to talk about the, uh, the history of the 442 and the Japanese American experience, we really have to go back to when it all starts. So by 1884, the Japanese government had allowed Japanese laborers to emigrate from Japan to work in the sugarcane plantations in Hawaii, fruit and vegetable farms in California. They were cheap labor. For, no, for lack of a better term, 
Japanese laborers were cheap. Um, so here they came. But as soon as they came, there was animosity because they were, they were cheaper labor. So they were driving the, the, uh, all, the folks that were already here, they were driving them out of work because they would work for cheaper, for cheaper labor costs. Um, and then in 1924, about oh, 40 years later, you have something called the Asian Exclusion Act, which was an expansion of the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act, which prohibited per permanent residence for Japanese and halted any other emigration into the United States after 1924. Um, ultimately, what you have at that point is you have the American government saying to the Japanese people and to the Asians, if you're here, we're gonna put you to work, but nobody else can come. And it was a really, really tough time for these Japanese people because most of the guys, who, most of the folks who came were men. They had wives and families back home in Japan and they were working to bring them here to America, but were not allowed to do so under the Asian Exclusion Act. The mass media would characterize the Japanese and Japanese Americans as untrustworthy, unassimilable. And as, Jap as the Japanese rose as a military power after the Shoah, um, the assumption of the Shoah Emperor Hirohito and the, uh, the uh, war ministers and whatnot in the 1920s and 30s, the Japanese in America were called agents of the Japanese Empire. There was a a very strong thought that there were spies among us, that there were, you know, subvertive Asian agents of Japanese ancestry who are here in the United States. So, of course, mass media played into that, and it it fed this this uh, this feeling of distrust of the Japanese American throughout the country. So I wanted to give a little bit of an understanding of the differences between mainland Japanese Americans and Hawaii born Japanese Americans. In the mainland, you had about 130,000 Japanese, either first or, gen or second generation, Issei or Nisei by 1930. Most of them, not all, but most of them were centralized in the Western states, in California, Washington, Oregon, some in Colorado, Arizona, those types of areas is where these guys were. And the Nisei, the second generation, were born in America and by birth were American citizens. That's very, very important to remember that by birth, they were American citizens. There was no question that they were citizens of this country. In Hawaii, Japanese Americans made up about somewhere between 40 and 60% of the economic workforce in Hawaii. So they were a driver of Hawaii's economy. They were prominent through business. They owned, they owned shops and stores and restaurants. And they even had their own, you know, along uh, downtown streets in Honolulu, you would find not only an English storefront sign, but a Japanese storefront sign. But also these second generation Japanese Americans here in Hawaii were by birth American citizens. Now as a caveat to that, some of these Nisei also had Japanese citizenship. It was a very difficult process, but some of the Issei parents wanted their children to have both American and Japanese citizenship. It wasn't very many, but there were some. And um, that would be a very vital part of the Pacific War, because those who held both citizenships, those who held uh, fluency in English and Japanese were used as interpreters and interrogators in the Pacific, the uh, military intelligence service. Um, moving on, though, the day everything changes is December 7th. 1941. On the left side of your screen, you'll see a headline from the Honolulu Star Bulletin. 
It says, War Oahu bombed by Japanese planes. And you see the uh, burning hulk of USS Arizona there in the photograph. On the right hand side, you'll find the Chicago Daily Tribune. And at the bottom, I ask, and, and it's, not a, it's not meant to drive racism home, but you'll see the difference in how the, the headlines are written. It, it always, you know, I used to teach this to, uh, to seventh and eighth graders uh, when I was teaching on the mainland for a bit. And they always picked up right away on the inherent racism on the mainland uh, in, in the Chicago Daily Tribune site. Um, and so I asked them why that is and if it was wrong. They all agreed that it was wrong, but they also understood that that's what life was then. It wasn't something that was necessarily on purpose, but it was a result of just the time. So we know December 7th as the day of infamy. But if you look like I do, the other day of infamy was February 19th, 1942. Amidst an atmosphere of political pressure, racism, and fear, President Roosevelt signs Executive Order 9066 on the 19th of February, 1942. Executive Order 9066 does not specifically mention Japanese Americans. I hope everybody understands that. It does not specifically mention the internment of Japanese Americans. What it does is it gives power to the military commanders in various areas of the, of the United States to exclude whichever persons these military commanders and the Secretary of War decided. Which is why in some areas, Japanese Americans were not touched. If you are outside the Western defensive perimeter, Japanese Americans, while they may have, while they may have experienced uh, de facto racism, they were not forcibly removed from their homes as they were in the Western defensive perimeter. What Executive Order 9066 does is it allows the military commanders and the Secretary of War to lawfully detain and, and imprison Japanese Americans. It suspends the writ of habeas, habeas corpus and it allows them to remove them from their homes. So that is exactly what they will do. The War Relocation Authority is formed and they will form 10 relocation centers on the mainland, two in California, two in Arizona, one in Utah, one in Colorado, one in Idaho, one in Wyoming, two in Arkansas. And what ends up happening is these folks who lived in the Western defensive perimeter, these Japanese Americans, were rounded up to, told to report to a train station with only the things they could carry, and were sent to places that ultimately would look like this. Long, lined up barracks, where you had maybe the, the size of a horse stable for your family, and you were going to live there for the next foreseeable future until the war was over. The photograph that you see there is Granada in Colorado. And I don't know if anybody looks at it. When you look at the, uh, the picture of Granada, and you look at another picture that's pretty, I will say infamous in World War II. If you look at a place like Auschwitz or an Auschwitz-Birkenau in, uh, in Europe, it's pretty similar in terms of the layout. Um, now I'm not going to say that the Nazi concentration camps and the American internment camps were the same, they weren't, but they were an unlawful imprisonment of Japanese Americans, I will argue. But things change over time. Simply put, the life in the relocation center was difficult. Folks who were taken from that Western defensive perimeter, California, Oregon, Washington, they'd never lived inland before and they never 
experienced the winters of Wyoming. The land was harsh and unforgiving. But they did their best as, and I will feather Japanese American cap here, they did the best as they would, as they could. They did their best to create a sense of family and community in the camp. By 1944, in many of the camps, you had Boy Scout troops pledging allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. You had baseball teams, football teams. You had dance clubs in the, in the, in the mess hall. You had farming and agriculture. You had Issei parents, first-generation parents, who made a bet with their Nisei children saying, ground here is hard, but give one year and I make from hard ground grow. And grow they did because at Heart Mountain in Wyoming, the farmers there, the, the Japanese American farmers there grew and raised their own food and fed the camp. And they were so successful using Japanese farming techniques in that hard ground that they actually sold their wares at farmers markets outside of the wire of the internment camps. They were given passes to go into Powell and sell their wares and they made money for the camp. And you can see here some of that uh, daily life. You'll see it looks like a, a normal town. You had, you had scouting, the meal services, and you had, you know, you had all those boys trying to pick up on that one little girl there. But it became the reality for these Japanese Americans who lived in these internment camps. You know, never mind the fact that uh, at the beginning, the, the mess stewards would give them pancakes with soy sauce and white rice with maple syrup. But, uh, you know, can't always get them all right. But meanwhile, back home here in Hawaii, a mass imprisonment of Japanese Americans did not make economic sense. After all, they were 40% of our, of our workforce. So aside from community leaders, um, teachers, priests, Japanese American community was not interned as much as they were on the mainland. Now, I'm not saying they weren't interned. There were several. There were about 3,000 from the territory of Hawaii who were actually sent to these internment camps on the mainland. But there were other fears and difficulties for Japanese Americans in Hawaii. Because they were not taken en masse as they were under Executive Order 9066, they could be scooped up from their homes at any time during the war. And that is what ended up happening for several. Uh, and I can speak from personal experience. My great grandfather was detained at the Sand Island Detention Center uh, here in Hawaii for about three weeks as they interrogated him. He lived in a tent city uh, with very little food or water or creature comforts. Uh, he was so afraid after that that the quote FBI man was going to come, that he went back to the family farm and he worked the farm during the day. And at night, rather than sleep in his bed, he would run into the hills behind the house and sleep in the caves to stay away from the FBI man that he was so afraid of. By 10 o'clock on the 7th of December, 1941, the territorial governor of Hawaii Governor Poindexter ordered the activation of the Hawaii Territorial Guard. The Territorial Guard in Hawaii consisted of ROTC students from the University of Hawaii at Mano, senior members of several of our junior ROTC programs who are already over 18, members of the American Legion. Within three weeks, the number of soldiers in Hawaii in the Territorial Guard was over 1,200 enlisted and 100 officers. But most of these men, many of them, were Japanese. So in January of 1942, due, again, in that same atmosphere of racism, fear, and distrust of Japanese, the Japanese American members of the Hawaii Territorial Guard were reclassified as 4C. 
enemy aliens unfit for service. There was no due process. They were roused from their bumps in the middle of the night and told the boys, pack your thing. But in February of 1942, the former 4C members, of the Hawaii Territorial Guard and the University of Hawaii ROTC program, they drafted a petition and ultimately, this petition would, group, would form a group called the Varsity Victory Volunteers, 169 members, nearly all Japanese American. They were encouraged to write this petition by a man named Hung Wai Ching. Hung Wai Ching was the leader of the YMCA here in Hawaii. And um, he went to visit the boys at the University of Hawaii at Manoa who were moping around in the quad said, you should go to class. And those boys said that they didn't want to go to class. They wanted to fight for their country. The army was starving for soldiers and these men, these able-bodied men were not allowed to fight. So Hong Wai Ching told them to write a petition, offer themselves up for service to the country in whatever way the, the government thought they would be best used. And so they did. And in their petition, they wrote, and I quote, Hawaii is our home. The United States, our country. We know but one loyalty, and this is to the Stars and Stripes. We wish to do our part as loyal Americans. 169 men signed that petition. What did they ultimately do? They went to work. They dug ditches, built roads, built barracks, built a jungle warfare training center. They built water towers. They ultimately became an auxiliary arm of the Army Corps of Engineers here in Hawaii. And that was their uniform. And you see there, they had the old doughboy helmet. They had a white t-shirt printed with a varsity victory volunteer. They worked hard, breaking rocks, doing all the things that the government told them they could do as 4C. In April of 1942, after the formation of the Varsity Victory Volunteers, there was a confidential memo sent to the War, the War Department that advocated the establishment of the Hawaiian Provisional Battalion. It comprised the soldiers primarily from the territory of Hawaii, former soldiers of the Hawaii Territorial Guard, with others who lived outside the Western defensive perimeter, outside the states of California, Washington, Oregon, and Arizona. You did have some of the mainland folks who were not in turn, who joined the 100th, what would become the 100th. On June 4th of 1942, on board the SS Maui, unbeknownst to their own family, 1,432 Hawaii are Americans of Japanese ancestry set sail for Oakland, California. On arrival in Oakland, the Hawaiian Provisional Battalion was redesignated as the 100th Infantry Battalion separate. They'd get on a train and they'd go for the Great White North in Wisconsin. They trained at Camp McCoy. They broke records there. And they would be transferred to Camp Shelby in Mississippi. And one of my favorite quotations that I got from a good friend of mine who's no longer with us, a, a, an original member of the 100th, a man named Goro Sumida. I asked him about his time in, in Camp McCoy and at uh, Camp Shelby. And he said, we couldn't just be soldiers. Well, he said it in a very thick pigeon accent. If you're from Hawaii, you understand what pigeon is kind of like Creole. He said. We don't can just be soldiers. We've got to be the best. It wasn't enough for them to just be soldiers. They had to be better than everyone else because there was so much suspicion about them. But the 100th would arrive in North Africa, on the 2nd of September, 1943. And this is an interesting tidbit that I just found out. That when they arrived in North Africa, General Eisenhower, refused to accept the Japanese soldiers. Instead, Lieutenant General Mark Clark of, the, Clark of the Fifth Army accepted the 100th and assigned them 
as an infantry battalion, a 34th Infantry Division, the Red Bull. They would see their first combat at Salerno during the Italian campaign, and would suffer the first of their many casualties on the 29th of September, 1943, by Private Joe Takata. As a separate infantry battalion, the 100th would see action at Salerno, Cassino, and Anzio during the Italian campaign. They were attached subsequently to the 442nd after its uh, development. They were supposed to be designated as the 1st Battalion of the, of the 442nd, but due to their stellar combat rec uh, record during the Italian campaign, they were allowed to keep their original designation as the 100th. So in the 442nd, you would, you would have normally had 1st Battalion, 2nd Battalion, 3rd Battalion, and onward. But because of the, the war record, the 100th Separate Infantry Battalion, they were allowed to keep that designation. You have the 100th, 2nd, 3rd, and 4th Battalions. Their distinctive unit insignias is shown here, comprised of, a, comprised of a bisected shield with an upper right white section with a taro leaf, the lower left section, the Hawaiian Mahi Ole War Helmet. The taro leaf is symbolic of their Hawaiian home. The red and yellow Mahi Ole War Helmet is representative of Hawaiian royalty. The soldiers of the 100th chose their own motto. And they said, remember Pearl Harbor. The 442nd is a direct result of groups like the Varsity Victory Volunteers in Hawaii and others on the mainland, Japanese American Citizens League and whatnot. The War Department authorized the creation of a combat regiment made entirely of Japanese American soldiers commanded by white officers. On March 1st of 1943, the 442nd Regimental Combat Team was formed. They would see combat in France and Italy from June of 1944 to May of 1945. Their rescue of the 1st Battalion, 141st Infantry Regiment, 36th Division in October of 1944 in the Vosges Mountains is chronicled as one of the 10 most important battles in the history of the United States Army. And I want to expand a little bit on that, if I might. The rescue of the Lost Battalion, big army, if you will, had spent three weeks trying to get to the 1st Battalion of the 141st. There was, they, they had not succeeded. Now, the men of the 100th and the 2nd Battalion, the 442, were coming off the line were given two days of rest. And General Dahlquist had ordered them to make a, an attempt to scale the cliffs and reach the Lost Battalion on two days of rest. So they packed their things, loaded their weapons, and set off under the cover of darkness. What had taken three weeks for Big Army to do the men of the 100th and the 442 did in three days. They reached the Lost Battalion, and a soldier named Mutt Sakumoto, one of the great names of the 442, a soldier named Mutt Sakumoto was the first one to reach soldiers of the first of the 141st. And I'll never forget, I was told what Mutt Sakumoto said to that uh, Texas soldier. He said, "Yeah, and you guys like one cigarette. And uh, ultimately, the men of the 100th and the 442nd would be honored by Governor Connolly of Texas as honorary Texas citizens in 1963. In April, of May, April and May of 1945, the 442nd, after coming off the line, would be attached to the 92nd Infantry Division, the Buffalo Soldiers segregated unit of African-American soldiers. So they put the African-Americans and the Japanese-Americans together under one division, the 92nd. Not a lot of people know that. 442nd would become the most decorated regiment in the history of the United States Army. It remains today as the only infantry combat arms unit in the United States Army Reserve headquartered at Fort Shafter in Hawaii. 
This company is located in Guam, Saipan, and American Samoa. And again, like I said earlier, we are very honored to have Colonel Keith Horikawa with us. He's a former commander of the 100th Battalion. So go for broke, sir. Thank you very much for being here. Through their exploits, the soldiers of the 442 would receive the following awards in World War II. Nearly 14,000 men served in the 442nd in World War II. They received seven presidential unit citations for combat valor, 21 medals of honor. Most of them awarded in 2000, but one awarded during the war. Your private Sadao Munimori was awarded the Medal of Honor during his, for his actions during World War II. He smothered a grenade and uh, was awarded the Medal of Honor. 52 Distinguished Service Crosses were presented to men of the 442. 560 Silver Star Medals were awarded to men of the 442, and over 4,000 Purple Heart Medals for combat wounds. I want you to take a look at the, the photograph on the right, the two, the two pictures on the right here. First one I want you to look at is the one on the bottom, the first shoulder sleeve insignia of the 442nd Regimental Combat Team. It consists of a bomb burst, a yellow hand holding a bloody dagger. Soldiers of the 442, when this was created for them by the Institute of Heraldry, refused to wear this patch. They said, no, we will not wear it. They did not sew it onto their uniforms and there's no record of them ever having worn it other than being issued it. So they asked to create their own. And what they ended up creating was the Torch of Liberty. This, is, this insignia lives on today as the shoulder sleeve insignia of the 100th Infantry Battalion, 442nd Regiment. It's the one that my grandfather wore the one that all my uncles wore. It's the one that I wear on my shirt today. The legacy of the Japanese American experience and Japanese American soldier. Because of the bravery of these Japanese American soldiers in World War II, coupled with the fact that there was never any instance of sabotage or spying by Japanese Americans during World War II, folks like myself, and many of us that are in attendance tonight, can live in the United States of America without fear of being judged by race or color. And when President Truman awarded the 442nd the presidential unit citation at the end of the war, he says, you fought not only the enemy, you fought prejudice and you've won. And keep up that fight. And I think for me as a fifth generation Japanese American, far, far removed from the horrors of World War II, it is my job now to keep up the fight, keep up the, the uh, take up the mantle, if you will. Because the, the men who fought in the 442 and the 100th and all the Japanese American regiments, the MIS, the 1399th, they fought and paid for it with their blood to not take up that mantle, to not keep up that fight for equality, for recognition, for representation would be a disservice to them. I will not dishonor my grandfather's memory like that. It's not something I'm gonna do. And I wanted to show a couple other photographs. This is this one right here is me um, at the 125th anniversary of Japanese immigration to Hawaii. Um, we did a, we did a reenactment and I was fortunate enough to be able to carry the guide on of my grandfather's company. He was a headquarters, he was a soldier in the headquarters company. And this little bottom one is an aloha to all of you. Um, this was actually a, an image made after the passing of Senator Inoue. And I wanted to just close with this. President Reagan in his inaugural address, he says, those who say that we live in a time without heroes, they just don't know where to look. The men we just discussed are my heroes. They're in the audience tonight. And so I thank them tremendously from the bottom of my heart. But more than that, they're not just my heroes, they're my family. And so with your all's permission, 
I'd like to dedicate this, this presentation to the memory of my grandfather, Private First Class Harumi Yamamoto, Headquarters, Headquarters Company, 2nd Battalion, 442nd Infantry Regiment. And my uncle is Private First Class Kiyomi Yamamoto, Private First Class Yoshimi Yamamoto, and Sergeant Katsumi Tug Yamamoto, all of whom served proudly in the 442nd. And with that, I will say, go for broke. Thank you very, very much. All right, thank you so much, Neil. All right, let me get my computer set. Thank you. I know um, on behalf of everybody who is signed in, we are they're not all with us today to give you um, a round of applause or a thank you. Uh, we have a mahalo coming in. Thank you for your time and your presentation this evening. We are going to be transitioning over to our question and answer. So if you'd like to stay with us, we do have a hard end time um, around 8 to 8, 15 ish. So we will be cutting off then. Uh, we will do our best to get to as many of your questions as humanly possible. Um, so we'll get started with I did have one come in through the chat Neil so we're going to start there tonight uh, can you remind us what was the name of the Japanese regiment battalion that was formed before the 442nd you mentioned it in your presentation could you remind us that was the uh that was the 100th infantry battalion mm -hmm. um, that was the actual combat unit uh, that was formed before the 442 uh, but before that was something called the varsity victory volunteers um Varsity Victory Volunteers was that group, again, of previously 4C, um, 4C um, students from the University of Hawaii who were in the Hawaii Territorial Guard, who ultimately were not allowed to serve. All right. Can you tell Probably us a little bit months. more? Can you tell us a little bit more about how they came up with the Go for Broke slogan? Like, how did that become their motto? Is there a story behind that? Sure, sure. Um, the, the Go for Broke slogan. Uh, is a pidgin, pidgin English in Hawaii. We have, you know, down south in, in Louisiana, you have Creole. Here in Hawaii, we have pidgin English. And go for broke was a gambling term. Um, it meant shoot the works, give it all you got, okay. bet the farm. And uh, it became kind of this, uh, this rallying cry for them to give everything they had because they knew, I, I, I would argue that the soldiers of 442 and 100th, they knew what was riding on this. They knew that their blood on the foreign battlefield was going to make easier the lives of their parents and their children when they came home. Mm. So they, they would fight and die if necessary. All right. Um, do we have any information? Were there any female um, officers or any females who were involved with the group, the unit? Uh, not that I know of in World War II. Um, not that I know of, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, this quest has, um, has a question about, what about the MIS? Do you have any comments or any information about the MIS? Uh, yeah, so the MIS, um, a lot of those guys were fluent in Japanese. Um, they were trained at military language school at the Presidio uh, in San Francisco, most of them. And they would be dispatched to units all across the Pacific Theater, and I, I, if, I'm, if I might, I want to share a, a quick story about one of them, um, a man named Herbert Yanomoro. Uh, Herb Yanomoro was actually, he was in the 442, as I understand. Um, he was taken because of his language skills, and um, he was assigned to another unit that ended up at the Battle of Okinawa. Hmm. And, uh, and after the Battle of Okinawa, um, they gave him a microphone, a megaphone that they hooked up and a script to read from. Basically the script read, you know, come to the sound of my voice, the American soldiers will not harm you. Um, that was what the government had told him to say. Um, that pretty much failed up until the point when Herbert Yanomura began to speak without, without the cue card. Uh, mm -hmm. He said to them, he said over a loudspeaker that he's Japanese. He's Japanese American. He grew up in Hawaii. He understood that they were afraid, but that he swore to them that if they came to the sound of his voice, that they would not be harmed. He swore on his life that they would not be harmed. Um, all told, some 1,200, I think, I, 
don't quote me on that number, but over a thousand Japanese Americans or Japanese on Okinawa actually came to the sound and were rescued by the Americans. Um, fast forward 70 years later, Herbert Yanomura was a guest of honor in Okinawa. Uh, he flew back for the first time and was, um, was greeted at a local church in Okinawa, not only by the governor of the prefectural governor of Okinawa, but also by a now old lady who said to him, it's you, it's you. I heard you when I was five years old and I came to the sound of your voice and I'm alive today because of what you said. So that's one of the most, to me, one of the most heart-wrenching stories. And uh, General MacArthur is quoted as saying that the MIS shortened the war by two years because of their language skills and their, their ability to decipher Japanese code. Wow, one of our guests is saying thank you for sharing that story. Her father was a part of the MIS, so thank you for your father's service. Um, when combined with the Buffalo Soldiers, did they see any action together? Was it a lot? Was it a little bit of action? To my knowledge, not much. Uh, by that time, by the time they were, um, they were combined with the Buffalo Soldiers, um, they ultimately had, um, the, the Nazis had surrendered or were on the verge of surrendering, um, you know, late late April, early May, 1945. So I do not believe they saw any um, heavy action. Absolutely. I have one guest who's sharing with us that she believes um, that Japanese American women served as nurses during the war. I would love to learn more about that. It'd be another great future presentation. Thanks, I'd love to learn more about that. Yeah, that's not, uh, that's something that I'm not too yeah, familiar. I'd love to learn more about that. I'd love to learn more about, yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I do want to ask a very, this is a very broad store question. I'll go ahead and answer. I've been getting a lot of questions on this. Yes, uh, we are recording the presentation tonight with Neil's permission. We will be posting it on our YouTube uh, channel, the First Division Museum's YouTube channel. If you'd like me to send you a direct link to that via email, it's real simple. I'm happy to do that for you. You could just head over to your email, send me one personally at, at L Sears, like the store, at um, F as in first, D as in division, museum.org. Um, my email is in the, uh, the link to this presentation this evening. Feel free to drop me an email and I'll send it to you right away. I usually have the um, them up on YouTube about the following Monday afterwards, barring any kind of emergencies or anything like that. So yes, you will be able to watch again and I'll watch at your leisure. Well, um, right. I'm going through some of these uh, questions and yeah. one, you, one, so you one go for it. I do want to uh, focus on was uh, someone asked about the 522nd. The 522nd yeah. artillery was the uh, artillery arm of the 442, and they have a very unique story. Um, they were actually detached from, from the 442. Um, I guess a little later in the war, I want to say maybe April time in 1945, and they were among the first to liberate Dachau. Um, so when they got there, they were able to, to, they actually saw the survivors of Dachau crawling out of the, uh, the quote unquote barracks. And it was, a, it was a thing that they, the soldiers never ever forgot. They, um, they just, you know, I remember talking to a couple guys who were in uh, 522nd and they said, the smell you cannot forget, the sight you cannot forget. You'd look at these, these um, survivors and it's like they were already dead. Wow. I did go ahead and I shared my email in the, um, mm -hmm. in the link for everybody. And again, we aren't using the hand raise feature this evening. So please use the Q&A button and we'll try and get to as many as possible. Um, I had one guest who was looking for your opinions on more resources, like where can I go and learn more? Again, we can only cover so much history in this hour and 15 minutes together. Uh, where can we go and learn more? And I will like to add to that one guest um, suggested uh, the Nisei Veterans Legacy website. I'm gonna drop that in the chat as well. Thank you for sharing that resource with us. Um, my I would, I would also say, you know, uh, Nisei Veterans Legacy is a great resource. Uh, something called the Gopher Broke National Education Center, GFBNEC. Um, they're also a very good. Uh, here locally in Hawaii, um, the, uh, the 
Kapiolani Community College, uh, the University of Hawaii Manoa definitely uh, has tremendous amounts of, um, of oral histories about the 442. Um, the Japanese American National Museum in California is another, another place to look. Um, Japanese American Veterans Association. Um, these are all wonderful, wonderful places to, to expand your knowledge. Uh, and for me, I will say that that's really where a lot of my research starts is just finding a story that you want to tell um, and that you want to know more about and just, you know, diving right into it. Uh, Gwen Fujie in the, in the chat has put in some of the other resources. Uh, Gwen's, a, again, a, a wonderful historian and about the, uh, the Japanese American experience as well. Tell us a little bit about the um, the hundredth. Um, they're still active in in Hawaii. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. The hundredth and the four forty second. The hundredth battalion uh, is still active in Hawaii at the Army Reserve. And as I said, they are the only uh, combat arms infantry unit in the United States Army Reserve. All right. Were all the Japanese American soldiers enlisted, or were there some officers? Um, there would ultimately be some officers. Initially, they were not. Uh, they were initially, at the time of their induction into the Army, they were all enlisted. Um, there is one interesting story, though. Uh, a colonel by the name of Young Ok Kim. Young Ok Kim, definitely not a Japanese name, but he was Korean. So he looked Japanese, but he wasn't. He was Korean. And, um, <clears throat> and what ended up happening was that he, he'd been a college graduate, and... Um, so he was made an officer because he wasn't Japanese. So uh, Young Oak Kim was one of the uh, early non-white officers of the 442. Others would be um, men like uh, like Danny Noy. He was he would receive a battlefield commission as well. So um, really, really a great, great story. Excellent. Um, do you have any any information about the integration of Japanese American soldiers um, into the army? Uh, did they happen post World War Two? Um, you know, I don't have too much on that, but I will say that uh, I think I saw him in the uh, audience tonight or in the uh, on the call tonight. Um, it took up until the nineteen nineties for us to have a four-star Japanese American general. And that was General Eric Shinseki who becomes the uh, chief of staff of the army. Um, you know, he truly was a trailblazer. General Shinseki really was. Um, Vietnam veteran, West Pointer. Um, but I think that because of the 442, you see a push toward, the, or toward overall integration, not just of Japanese Americans, but also of of African Americans, women, um, Latinos, all of these different, uh, all these different ethnic groups that have been underrepresented for such a long time, uh, because of the exploits of not just the 442, but the 442, the Montfort Point Marines, the Tuskegee Airmen, the Women's Army Air Corps, the the waves, the um, the Navy nurses, all of these different underrepresented minorities who were forced into service in World War II, I think play a huge role in the overall integration of our military service. Thanks, I'm getting these in. I have so many wonderful um, suggestions for resources coming in. I'm trying to get them all and I apologize if I miss anybody's on accident. I'm trying to get them into the chats for everybody. Let's go through, and uh, Neil, feel free to look through the questions as well if you see anything that pops up. Um, so one of the questions is asking about where did they come from and where did they train? Um, so yes, you're right. There were originally 3,000 volunteers. Um, here in Hawaii, our quota was supposed to be something like 1,500. Um, 10,000 showed up. Hmm to volunteer. Um, I understand that they did, uh, most of their training was at Camp Shelby in Mississippi. Um, 
before being shipped off as replacements. Um, you know, there's an interesting story about Hattiesburg, Mississippi and Camp Shelby. It's a guy named um, Earl Finch. Earl Finch was the uh, quote unquote patron saint of the 442. He would hold dances and feed the soldiers at holiday times and things like that. Uh, he actually dedicated a memorial stone here in Hawaii, uh, which my Kiwanis Club is actually honored to, to take, uh, take care of nowadays. Um, but yeah, Earl Finch in Hattiesburg, Mississippi was the, uh, was the patron saint, if you will, of the 442. Um, someone made, made uh, mention of the film Go For Broke starring Van Johnson. Um, yes, great film. Um, relatively accurate, I would argue. Um, but yeah, I mean, there, there, are other, there are other films that are as good, if not better, uh, in my opinion. Uh, there's one called um, Only the Brave that is directed by a man named Lane Nishikawa. It's a great, great, um, great film. It's one of those independent film types of things. Um, and another question they asked about is suffering many casualties because they wouldn't give up. And that's absolutely true. Um, I don't know the exact numbers of how many went in and how many came back. I'm not sure of that. But I will tell you the story of the reverse AWOLs. Um, guys who would be wounded, sent to field hospitals or wherever they were going to go to recover, sneaking out of the hospital with their bandages still on to, re to rejoin their, uh, their brothers out on the battlefield. And, uh, again, that's really indicative of that spirit that was pounded into them back home of live if you can, die if you must, but always fight with honor. They believed, much like Japanese soldiers did, that you know resting on your wounds was dishonorable. So, mm. um, yeah. Is there? Do you have any um, input on how the history of the four four forty second is viewed in Japan? Um. I have a little bit about that. I don't have too much, but I will say um, that Japanese today are incredibly proud of the 442 because they tend to focus on the Japanese warrior spirit um, exhibited by the Japanese American soldiers. Um, you know, they actually, I will say that they do have their own reenactment club over there in Japan. Uh, mm -hmm. A friend of mine who lives in Japan is actually a part of that. And he actually really does look the part. Um, but uh, culturally, I think a lot of the students in Japan don't really know the story of the 442. But when they're told the story, um, they cannot help but feel very proud of the fact, not so much the fact that they are Americans as we celebrate here in America, but they're more proud, I think, of the fact that they're Japanese, you know, um, and they fought with such great honor. Right, um, I have another one. Um, I have a guest who is, is, is wondering if this is a correct statement or not, or your opinions on it, um, that the uh, 442 was originally sent into the toughest battles because they were seen as being expendable. Um, um, have you heard that before? I've heard it. I've heard it. Um, and I have two different opinions on it. Um, sure. On the one hand, I agree. Uh, yes, they they were expendable. I mean, they were, it, for lack of a better term, they were, they were this grand experiment, uh, much like the Massachusetts 54th in the Civil War. They were this grand experiment to see whether or not we could trust the Japanese American. Um, so if we couldn't and they got slaughtered, hey, we tried the experiment and it failed. Uh, the other side of it, the other side of it is no, I disagree. And maybe this is just my own hubris, but uh, oh, I believe that the, the 442 was sent in because they were the absolute best there was. They were that good. So... So, yeah. Yeah. 
All right, I have one guest. He wants to know a little more about the Lost Battalion. Um, can you tell us the story of after the Lost Battalion was rescued when General Clark was passing out citations to the 442 and mm. asked where are all the men? Sir, this is all the men, as many as wounded or killed, could, uh, or killed that during the rescue. Not, um, that was actually not General Clark. That was actually General Dahlquist. Uh, after the battle for to rescue lost battalion, which was uh, in late October of 1944, um, they were the um, the regiment was ordered to form up uh, for a review by General Dahlquist, and um, so there were about 200 men in total at that formation, and so the general came to a I believe it might have been a captain who was standing at the head of the formation. And based summarily, as according to the legend, anyhow, is General Dahlquist chewed him out and he said, I told you to assemble the entire regiment. This is a company. Where's the rest of your men? And uh, this captain looked up at him with tears running down his face. He said, Sir, this is my regiment. All the rest of my men are wounded or dead. And the story behind that is that in the days of fighting to rescue the Lost Battalion, there were 211 members of the 1st of the 141st at a cost of 800, over 800 wounded or dead from the 414. So, you know, I mean, that's... Uh, that's a, a tremendous part of the, the, the legacy and the, the, the history and the mystique, I guess, behind the 442 is that they would be so willing to, to fight literally to the death to save their, their brothers, regardless of their race or persuasion, and fight in the, these seemingly insurmountable odds. Wow. I do have a, a budding historian who has a question for you. He's 10. Um, he loves history. You're in the right place. And um, he, his question is about the camps in which uh, the Japanese people were kept during the war. Um, and he had a question about how many buildings. And as you saw in the picture, there were a lot of buildings there. Do you mm. have an idea, Neil, maybe we can help him out? Um, roughly, do you have an estimate on how many people were kept in each of those camps? I want to, I mean, it would vary. It would vary, but I want to say at the one that you saw in Granada, I want to say somewhere in the neighborhood of 18 to 20,000. It's a lot of people. All right, thank you for your question. Keep reading more about history. All right, let's see. Like I said, we have a lot more. So, oh my goodness. Hi, Grawski. Hello, hello. All right, I think we do have time for one more. And I do wanna, uh, I do wanna prelude this because there are so many questions here this evening. Um, please do not feel discouraged if I did not answer. We not, did not get to your question or your comment this evening. Um, Neil is very gracious and is happy to answer any questions uh, via email. So if I did not get to your question and you're dying to know, you think of one in the middle of the night, please, 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 um, you have my email in the invitation this evening, send me an email. I'm happy to put you in contact with Neil and get all those questions answered for you. But do you think we have time for one more, Neil? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so you had mentioned that uh, them having set records in their training camps. Uh, what would that have been like? Uh, and where did they train in Wisconsin? They, came, they trained at the Camp McCoy in Wisconsin. Um, and those training records would have been for marksmanship, athletics, um, you know, just basic. And, and in the Army now, they, they've got the, uh, this term of warrior tasks and drills. Uh, and each unit is evaluated on their warrior tasks and drills, their attention to detail, their, um, is, is insofar as the, uh, the, the shine on their boots and the shine on their brass. Um, I, I, and I want to make a, a little bit of a blanket, a um, little bit of a blanket statement about that. Um, the soldiers of the 442 set those records not because they were individually great men. I'm not saying that they weren't great men. They all were. But it is, I think, a collective mindset amongst all of them that says we, you know, and it's, it's best summed up 
in what uh, Goro Sumira said to me. We cannot just join the army. It's not enough. We cannot just be good soldiers. We have to be the best there ever was. Because they knew, I, I, I truly, and I will take this to my grave, they truly believed, and I really think they knew what was riding on their success on the battlefield. They knew it was not, not just to come home back to their families, but that an entire ethnicity of people was, was, was riding on their success in battlefield, on the battlefield. And that even goes as far back as, you know, on, into the internment camps before they had left. Um, there's a Japanese tradition of something called the Senin body. The Senin body is it's a white silk scarf. And the women in the village and in the camp would stitch a red dot into the, uh, their, their scarf. They wore it around their bellies. And it was supposed to be indicative of the hopes, the dreams, and the and the the good wishes of everyone in their village. So they would wear it around their their um, their bellies. And there's story of these soldiers who would be wounded in the gut, and they would use this senin body, they would use this this belly band, and they would tie it extra tight in in form of like a, a traction. Um, but Again, just to get back, reiterate the point, they knew what was riding on this. They knew that it wasn't just about their exploits, but it was also about never being able to cast doubt on the Japanese American population in this country ever again, because they were willing to fight and die as they did in World War II. Well, thank you again, Neil. And just as a reminder to everybody, questions, comments that we did not get to tonight, please email. I'm happy to put you in contact with Neil um, and get you the answers that you're looking for. But I do want to remind everybody that, like Krawoski did at the top of our presentation, that our next date with history is a part of our continuing uh, commemoration of the 30th anniversary of uh, Desert Storm. Um, so that will be on Feb Wednesday. It's not on a Thursday next time. It's on a Wednesday, making note of it. Wednesday, February 24th at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. Uh, the presentation is on the book Desert Red Leg Artillery Warfare in the First Gulf War uh, by First Division veteran um, uh, Lee Scott Lingenfelter. So we are looking forward to hosting him next. We hope you'll be able to join us. Thank you everybody for signing in and sharing your evening with us again. We always look forward to having all of you here with us virtually. All right, Kurosky, do you have any parting words? The only parting words I have is, uh, Neil, that was great. Laura knows I keep my uh, camera off and my sound off because uh, a lot of that touched me. You and I know the 92nd in the connection. I came across that in 94. Uh, you talked about the Exclusionary Act. Uh, for those who are asking about uh, Japanese American women, Brenda Moore uh, wrote a book. Uh, there were about 500 uh, Japanese uh, American women who served as nurses and in five other organizations. And uh, you just hit the nail on the head. We appreciate it. And uh, great comments. Looking forward to having you back. Thank you very much, sir. It's Aloha. A, it's an honor and a privilege. All right. Thank you. All right. Bye bye. Good night. Aloha, Neil. And send us some of your good weather. <laughs> good night, everybody.